Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we are going to be venturing back into Skimwalker territory for some truly terrifying stories of top quality. So get extra comfortable, subscribe, like, and hit the bell icon for good measure, and let the darkness take control. My name is Valadin. I'm 25, and I moved to Kentucky from Vladivostok when I was 10 years old. My parents divorced, and I went with my father, while my mother stayed in Russia. My father served in the Soviet military, specifically in the VDV. He was diagnosed with cancer when I was 19, and sadly passed six months later. He left me all of his military gear that he kept when the USSR collapsed, including his rifle and the cabin that he owns in the south of Kentucky, close to the Tennessee border. This information is purely contextual. My father trained me very well in survival, so that I could be strong like him. I spent much time camping and hiking. I had a couple of friends who would often come with me while in high school, Grisha from Serbian descent and James, a redneck. After high school though, James and I got out of touch, but Grisha and I remained close. One day, James texted me and asked if I wanted to go camping. I felt like this would be a good chance to rekindle our friendship, and I offered to have us camp at my father's old cabin. He asked if he could bring his new girlfriend, and I said it would be fine. But not wanting to feel like a third wheel at my own party, I thought I'd invite Grisha along too. Unfortunately, he was busy with work, so he couldn't come. Fast forward two weeks, and I drive up to the mountains and go to my father's old cabin, which is now mine. I parked my SUV, grabbed my backpack full of gear, spare clothes including my father's old VDV uniform, MREs and my rifle. I had brought 500 rounds of ammo with me, and I began to settle in, lit the fireplace, laid out my sleeping bag in the loft, and broke out a bottle of vodka. James was due to arrive the following evening. I had a few drinks and the sun was setting, so I cooked up some MRE eggs and bacon, and after eating, I went to use the outhouse. I sat in the outhouse doing my business. I was quite excited to be away from work and reconnecting with my friend. When I left the outhouse, something smelt awful. It's like the smell of rotten eggs, but I brushed it off as one of the various scents of being in the wilderness and returned back to the cabin, trying to forget about the odd scent. I drank some more vodka and went to sleep. Turns out I slept like a rock for almost a day, and I awoke with a bad hangover. After being awake for a little while, I brewed myself some coffee, when I heard tires coming up the driveway. In my haze, I had forgotten that James was coming. I was on edge and grabbed my rifle, when I looked out the window to see a beaten up Dodge Ram coming up the road. Then I remembered and it all clicked. I felt happy when I saw James driving it, until I saw who was sitting next to him. It wasn't just his girlfriend. It was one of my exes. Her name was Alicia. My stomach began to turn. We had broken up less than three months ago. I wasn't really sure how to handle this situation. I felt angry, but still wanted to fix our friendship. He got out of the truck. His loud country music was loud enough to scare off much of the wildlife, which gets on my nerves. They came in and sat in total silence. The tension was so heavy in the air, you could cut it with a knife. Man, you guys are pretty awkward. Have you met before? I became angry and just said, ask her. I could see Alicia's face shift to one of anger. Listen, you Euro trash, you're the one who said I could come. We don't need your crap to start. James asked her to calm down and they stepped outside and I'm assuming she explained everything to him. 
James came back inside without her and was quite angry. He slapped me across the face and asked me why I had cheated on her. I hadn't. It was the other way around. I was angry that she lied about me, and then being slapped had pushed me over the edge, and I punched him in the face and pinned him against the wall with my forearm against his throat and asked him what his problem was. He spat in my face and asked me to let him go. I started to twitch with anger. We then heard Alicia scream outside, and she threw the door open. I released him from my grip, and he gasped for breath, and I began to calm down, as did he. James asked what was happening. She yelled out that she saw someone outside. She was sweating and her face was white. What do you mean he saw someone? James probed. I saw a big man in the woods. He was, he, uh, he looked like he was wearing a goat mask. It's got to be some silly, psycho, hillbilly, satanic cultist, we thought. I broke my silence and called her out. This is my family land. There's no one around for miles. The closest neighbor is five miles away. She called me an ass and told me that if I didn't go look, she was going to call the cops and say that I hit her. I wanted to avoid dealing with the police, so I grabbed my father's old rifle and stepped out. I looked angrily at James and said, you're really just gonna sit here and let her do this? You're some kind of friend. I walked out. The sky was clear and the moon illuminated the clearing that the cabin sat in. I put a 30 round magazine into my rifle and readied myself. I silently prayed to St. Michael and walked to the back of the cabin and held my rifle in the low ready position. I heard a branch snap in the forest. I looked in that direction and pointed my rifle towards the sound. I heard the sound of the cabin door shut and then I heard two car doors shut as well. James' truck started and floored it down the road. James yelled out the window, Screw you and your communist dad, you can get killed by the cultist. I thought, thanks, ass. I was distracted enough to forget about whatever was in the forest. But then I heard something saying what James had just said. It sounded like, screw you and your communist dad, but it sounded wrong. It sounded like an animal was trying to talk. Like one of those cats or dogs you see on YouTube. But it was trying to put together a sentence. Then I realized I could smell the rotten egg smell. I began to yell in Russian to seem intimidating. That is when I saw a pair of yellow eyes rise up. They had to be eight feet off the ground, and I knew it wasn't normal. I heard my dad's voice in my head. He's the one who told me to never be afraid to defend yourself. I grew angry that this person was mocking my painful situation and that they were trespassing. I unloaded all 30 rounds and grabbed the spare magazine in my back pocket and began to back towards the cabin. I made it back inside. I threw the bar over the door and sat without sleeping. And I heard it outside still, mocking my voice and James's and Alicia's voices, mimicking what we had said. I eventually passed out due to running out of adrenaline. I woke up, grabbed my stuff, and left. I never heard from James or the she-devil again, and I have been back to the cabin often but have never seen anything since. This happened about four years ago now. It was the 4th of July. A few of my friends wanted to do something instead of just lounge in front of our computers like we did every day. There were five of us, me, Neil, Elijah, JD, and Neil's sister, Katie. Neil had the idea to go to his grandparents' house as they owned a farmhouse. We live in Texas, so having that much space, especially with other houses being half a mile out, it was the perfect place to pop fireworks without getting into too much trouble. The drive from where we lived to their house was about a 40 mile drive. Unfortunately, the only car we had at our hands was a two door so trying to fit five of us into one car was hectic to say the least. The drive was actually tolerable, 
three of my friends in the back found a comfortable yet funny position to sit in the car. The music Katie was playing was helping a lot and definitely passed the time. We all bought some fireworks halfway there, and my friends jumped back into their designated position for another 20 miles. As we got there, Neil forgot to mention that his grandparents were out of town for the week, which made the experience ahead of us even better. All of us got out of the car except for Katie, who suggested she would get us all food and sodas for the night. She kept the fireworks in the back because she didn't want us popping any while she was gone. She drove off, and all of us were left without fireworks. So we did the next best thing, and went to the pool in the back. Something that already put me off was that the ranch sat considerably near a forest. Neil even went the extra step to tell me that there are occasional wolves that can be a hassle to deal with. Of course, I got nervous because I had nothing to defend myself with if one jumped over the fence. He handed me his pocket knife, saying that there's a shotgun in the living room if something goes down. He mentioned that he was going to set up a game of risk for us to play while Katie was gone, as the drive to the nearest market was over a few miles away. So Elijah and I sat poolside telling stories to each other about stupid stuff that happened while we were in college. During our talk, I was staring out into the forest line, paranoid about the aforementioned wolves that Neil teased me about. I saw something move. I couldn't tell since the porch light behind me was making it harder to see any details, but the way it moved made my heart jump. Elijah could see my body language change as I leaned in to see what was there. He started to ask me what I saw, and I thought I saw a wolf on the tree line. He looked towards where I pointed and calmed down. That's just Katie, dude. She's trying to scare us. He started calling her name, waving his arm and laughing, saying how she scared the hell out of me. Neil came out of the house, wondering what Elijah was screaming about. Then he saw his sister standing in the field. He started to laugh when Elijah told him what happened and how I was on the edge of my seat. JD came out of the house next, and Neil told him to help Katie with the bags and grab the fireworks. Katie, who was out in the field, started to wave back. But the wave definitely seemed out of place. It wasn't so much of a wave as a jerk motion, like you were trying to pop your elbow. Elijah yelled for Katie to come back, so that we could start the party. But JD came back with a terrified look on his face. Katie's not back yet. I just called her. She's still on the road to Walmart. The laughing died abruptly, and Elijah's face faded. His arm fell on top of his lap with a thud. Everyone looked at the still jerking figure in the field. Then, she screamed. The scream was so loud it sounded like it may as well have been a few feet in front of us. We all scrambled, running to the house, slamming the door behind us. Neil shouted for us to all lock the doors and to grab the shotgun in our living room. I ran to grab his shotgun, as it was the closest thing to us, while the other two ran to each of the doors leading outside. Quickly, I grabbed the shotgun and stuffed a few shells into my pocket running back to the kitchen where we came from and handed the gun to Neil. I pulled out the shells, set them on the counter, and he loaded one in. JD came back covered in sweat, freaking out and shouting about what the hell was that thing. We were all just as scared as each other. I look at them both, Elijah quickly joining us again. You don't think it was a, uh, one of those skinwalkers, do you? I've read stories on 4chan and creepypastas, but I thought it was all fake. JD reassured us, saying that that was just children's tales and to not believe nonsense we read on the internet, and that he was fairly sure it was Katie pulling a very elaborate prank. Cut the bullshit, JD. That scream wasn't human. He turned back to the door, pushing the blind slightly to find that 
Katie, was closer to us. It stood at the gates of the pool illuminated by the light and revealing to us something that didn't look much like Katie at all. The hair was a mess. The clothes looked tattered. Her skin bruised. The one thing that caught our eye the most was her face. Her head was tilted, almost as if it was struggling to support the weight. The eyes were blank. The jaw was agape. It raised an arm jerking, as it did before in a mock wave. The jerking, however, started to get more violent, and the entire body began shaking uncontrollably. Neil quickly closed the curtains and backed off. He ordered us to sit back behind the counter and set himself in the gap, leading into the kitchen. Gun aimed at the door. It was silent for what felt like an hour. The three of us continued to look at Neil, who was completely focused on the door. A massive, grotesque smell entered our noses as all of us reacted appropriately. The horrid stench was like if you left groceries to ferment in a box in the summer heat, with a few carcasses as garnish. It was hard to breathe, tasting the smell in the back of your throat, even with your nose pinched. It was so bad, JD actually threw up. Then, without warning, the smell was gone. The hot air that was the smell went away, and suddenly it was easier to breathe. I was afraid to let go of my nose, but was rewarded with a breath of fresh air. Everyone took a couple of breaths to rid their lungs of the pugnant smell that lingered beforehand. Neil asked us if we were okay, and we all replied. JD being an exception, as he puked. We heard what sounded like a whine. It sounded like a mix between a dog and a child about to cry. It wasn't coming from the porch door, but from the front, where we came in front of the car. All of us stood up, Neil moving forward while we stayed back. We knelt down by the stairs, still hearing the whining. It didn't hit me until we positioned ourselves, but it sounded like something was trying to talk for the first time. In a raspy, high-pitched voice, I could make out small portions of sounds. It kept repeating sounds, until it started to sound more enunciated. It sounded like JD, same accent, same speech pattern, nearly the same voice. JD started to shiver, and shouted back in a scared voice to leave and get out now. But the thing imitated him. The last words that were heard were in the same scream we heard when we saw it initially. It began pounding on the door, not like it was trying to force itself in, but like an impatient knock. It started to scream in the same pitch we heard it when we initially saw it. It terrified all of us. The inhuman screams, the polite pounding on the door. I started crying. I thought this was it. Neil wasn't scared like us, though. He was pissed. He stood up, storming towards the door, screaming. He swung open the door, pointed his shotgun at whatever was on the other side, pulling the trigger, filling all our ears with the sound of the shotgun blast and the ringing to follow. Neil stood at the door, huffing. His body language was wanting to rip this thing apart. I stood up looking past his arm, seeing nothing but a shell on the ground. I looked up past his shoulders, seeing nothing but the driveway and the road leading back to where we came from. He turned around, the adrenaline fading away, and a shaky voice coming from his mouth. We're not staying here. JD, call Katie. Tell her to come back. The rest of the time, all of us were in the kitchen. The shotgun sat on the counter with several shells near the butt of the gun. None of us wanted to say anything. None of us wanted to look at each other. It was nothing but silence, until Katie called us. Neil quickly wrote a note, leaving it on the gun as we left. All of us hopped into the car, silent. Katie noticed our behavior and constantly egged us to tell her what happened. She pouted, put her music on the radio to cheer us up. But the only thing I could hear 
was the blood-curdling scream telling us to get out. I would often go camping with my grandparents, who I call my Gammy and Gampy. At the end of my school years, I would always look forward to it, since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loved the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course all the amazing wildlife I would see. Now I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest to me was like my true home. I always preferred being near trees and dirt rather than buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were much quieter and more peaceful, and I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this recurring dream during the last two weeks of my school year. I'd be in the woods, walking alone down a dirt trail. The woods were always strangely quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me, usually in my dream. I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, usually a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five, and it lasted until I was perhaps 11. Over the years, it would be the exact same thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on my hike with it alongside me. But about having this dream for the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel a bit uneasy about this fox. I would hear it making odd noises, but every time I went to look back, it was walking like nothing was wrong. Even, somehow, giving me a smile. Now that the dream's out the way, I can talk to you about my first true encounter. I was six years old and going on a camping trip with my Grammy and Gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited for it, barely being able to keep myself in my school seat for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my Gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats, me always being in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep in the woods and far from other people, as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we camped. As they were getting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig when I noticed how strangely quiet the woods were. It was never quiet not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it as I continued to dig for bugs. However, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would usually call me Sugar Bugger, that being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I heard, but it sounded like it was very far away and somewhat sick. I looked up where I heard it coming from that being from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about my weird encounter though, as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars there never being anywhere I lived. We started to get sleepy around nine and we got ready for bed. There were bunk beds that my gammy and I would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up 
Maybe hours later, it was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up that late in the night, since I always have had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side, trying to fall back asleep, until I heard it again. Sugar bugger. My eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken, but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep, and were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I sat there frozen in fear. I was trying to brush it off as tree branches or rain. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. I could tell that it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look, which was a big mistake. I pulled the curtains away to only peek, and what I saw were these large, yellow eyes. They seemed glassy, yet not entirely real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes, but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked, quickly closed the curtain back up, and then hid under the blanket. That being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face, I had never been so terrified in all my life. I just curled up into my Grammy's side and clung to her all night long, the damn tapping, only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did, and I remember my Gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I'd gotten up quick enough, we could still go fishing. I honestly didn't want to leave the trailer at all, terrified that whatever I saw that night was out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was constantly looking around, horrified that whatever I saw would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug. When she saw me, she asked what was wrong. I told her what I saw and heard, and surprisingly she believed me. The next thing I knew she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a little to convince him, but he did eventually start picking up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so that I could probably sleep, but I couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw, and that if I opened my eyes for a second it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far away when I heard it again, but this time, it was my actual name. Aaliyah. At that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes when we heard it. Then she got into the truck with me and pulled me in tight in a protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was sobbing so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed he'd take me home. We started to head out of the campsite still heard that this trip had been ruined by something, but I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did so, feeling a nice cold fear wash over me as I saw something. A red fox sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes. The same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its mouth into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to the campsite. We did continue the camp, but in more populated areas. I didn't tell my grandma what I saw, but she told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that it would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but it's not. There was one more encounter I had with this creature, and it's much more terrifying than the first. The second encounter I had was when I was 17. By this time, I very well knew what a skinwalker was, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas, still worried about seeing the fox, but I never really thought too much into it. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas. 
them living way up in a mountainous area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there isn't much reception at all, so unless we hooked onto their Wi-Fi, we basically had no phones. I didn't mind the house, still loved the woods no matter what happened. Although it irked me that they didn't close their window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see in. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything happen to us kids. Luckily, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could all look outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black Labrador about a year old called Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. Although she was easily excitable, she was a good puppy. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Although I'm a girl, I would rather have gone hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early, since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was really chilly in the morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam, it being a good way for her to get her exercise in and have fun. About an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued the walk, I began to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had suddenly become, hearing only our footsteps and my brother talking to my uncle. Pam noticed it too, her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get to my brother, worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby. I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though, even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at the time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I would worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six-year-old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though. Seeing my shoelace came undone, I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. But that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. At that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was, that same red fox still with those horrid yellow eyes and the same smile. Only this time I saw it much clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell of it was like decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox, the back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it, but now they looked emptier than I remember. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I couldn't. I was frozen, as I was too scared to even blink. But I heard it speak again. This time, however, it mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a little song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close. I was too scared to look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. 
On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that the thing was after me, and she protected me. I was very grateful that she was with us, as who knows what would have happened if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I spoke with my uncle and aunt. Once I told them what happened and what I saw, they had started to pray and checked that all the locks were shut tightly. My aunt putting something around the doors, I think it was probably ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short, as they were worried that I was not safe while in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day, them making an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they needed to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I left those woods, I did feel safe again. Before they had to drive me back home though, they told me it wasn't my fault and that luckily it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. Is it still around? How? Why? What did it want with me? Does it want my skin, my soul, or will I just be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have the answers to these questions, and that is what really scares me. Now, I've long since moved from California and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far nothing has found me. While I'm happy it hasn't, the concern is still there. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who truly knows how to get rid of this thing, and that's why I'm sharing this story with you now, so that I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, help me. When I turned 18, my brother and his friends took me camping in a spot called the Devil's Hole in Barrington Tops, northwest of Sydney, Australia. It was just a typical camping spot, a clearing in the trees with enough room to set up a few tents and a fire pit in the middle. After a day of four-wheel driving in the roads around the campsite, we went hunting for firewood and gathered a sizable pile, including an entire fallen gum tree about 30 meters long. Night fell, the fire was roaring, and beer was being consumed in great quantities. As usual, people were going off into the trees frequently for a pee, making more room for more beer. At one point, I headed into the bush, to a spot I'd claimed as my own personal toilet. My brother followed me with a torch, since it was pitch black, and it's not a bad idea to stick together in the Australian bush. We walked along a small path, about 50 meters from the campsite. After emptying our bladders, we turned back around onto the same path. We went about five meters when we noticed something standing on the path. A kangaroo, probably, 1.5 meters tall, standing there looking at us. We didn't hear it approach, which was strange since it was fairly dense bush, and there were sticks and leaves all over the ground. The kangaroo bounded off into the darkness, revealing something even more unusual. Behind it, on the formerly empty path, were three sticks standing in a triangle shape tied together at the top. We went in for a closer look. It was the way back to the campsite anyway. Sitting on the top of three sticks was a small human-shaped figure made out of twigs. Underneath the triangle was a piece of tree bark covered in different colored paints. At this point, we were pretty confused, but being a pair of drunk idiots, we picked up the stuff and headed back to the campsite and threw it in the fire. We didn't see any other signs of kangaroos, or wildlife really in general, over the rest of the time there, another day and night. Just that one lone kangaroo that appeared out of thin air. After a few years, I did some research, and it's possible we encountered a Kordeicha, an aboriginal ritual executioner, sometimes compared to a skimwalker. I've got a cousin down in Mississippi. He's a combat medic for the Mississippi National Guard, and he said he saw something out in the woods on a training op. A kind of mini war games type deal. But what he described seriously impacted me. 
let's see what you make of it. There were two war platoons per company, and two companies per team. Camp A, his camp, set up northwest of Yellow Creek, and the enemy, set up just south of a farm off Waynesboro, Shibuta, which is east of Waller's Ridge Road. So the exercise starts at midnight, and his platoon commander decides he may as well send out a group recon to scout a good ambush position, or at the very least, figure out what the enemy was up to. So my cousin's squad sets off north following some dirt trails, but keeping just off to the side in case they run into an enemy patrol. So, by about 2.30, they're about 500 meters out of the enemy's camp, slinking around a marsh, which puts them in clear sight through a power line, cut out through the woods. So the marksman pulls out his binoculars to check if the way is clear, and upon glancing just goes plain white and freezes. A few seconds later, the sergeant pulls his sorry ass back to the tree line and asks him, what the hell were you thinking? And the marksman, clearly about to crap himself, stammers something. Uh, there's something down the line. It ain't human, it ain't human. Everyone stood there in shock for a few seconds before some of the others decide to check for themselves. What they saw was described to me as a seven or eight foot tall furry thing. It's as if you took a coyote and put it on a stretching rack with matted white or gray fur with what looked like dried blood all over its chest. Its hind legs were 11 kinds of messed up, incredibly long and slender with knees backwards. The thing was just standing out in the open, sniffing around as if it were trying to track something. So the sergeant radios the sighting into Company HQ and gets back. Get the hell out of there. Keep your heads down and keep off the roads. Get some live rounds and weapons free. The game is off. So his squad gets the hell out, and the marksman, who at this point has finished having his panic attack, checks again. This time with his scope, rather than binoculars and the squad hurries back to Company HQ. When they get there, the sight is something to behold. Mounted patrol vehicles storming around the camp, spotlights scanning the tree line, comms going crazy with people seeing stuff in the woods, and another platoon had to be called to secure the area. There were no training exercises for the rest of the month, and an official order had to, and I quote, keep quiet and not tell anyone, not even family, had been put in order which needless to say, my cousin promptly ignored. To this day, he was sure it was a skinwalker. This is my mother's story, and she allowed me to share it. I'll be telling it from her perspective. We live in the desert, and things are always weird. So I was watching Netflix while laying in bed, and heard the chime of the security camera app notification. Now I had the app set that only the front door would give loud alerts at this time of night. But all the cameras were recording, just not providing alerts. This made me curious as to what is out there this late, and I sat and checked the recording. I saw a large coyote pacing in and out of the front door patio space, which is not very large and sort of enclosed. I thought that it was kind of odd since it didn't really look like the coyote was hunting anything and there's nothing in that area to pique the coyote's interest. So I started heading to the front door. I got to the door and looked through the peephole to see if I could see any animals that it might be hunting for and what I saw stole my breath. I saw what was the back of a bald head in the peephole. It stood for about a minute, not moving nor breathing and this bald head never moved either. Let me be clear. This looked like a man standing very close to the door with his back turned to it. Finally, I ran to the dining room to get a clear view of who was standing there. But when I got there, no one was there. And when I went back to the peephole again to check, nothing was there anymore. Now, there's no way anyone could walk in any direction without alerting one of the cameras around my home. So I checked the recordings. After the coyote, there was nothing. This freaked me the hell out as the cameras are set to record motion and clearly caught the coyote, but never showed anyone walking up or leaving. If anyone has an explanation that gives me peace of mind, 
I had appreciated. My immediate thought? Skinwalker. My mum and I were driving home after having dinner slash lunch at our new property with our friends. My aunt is in front of us and we're following her home as she's doing the same thing to us since we live pretty close together. We reach a bend and my aunt slows down and her lights shine on a dog. Immediately, my mum recognises it and says, "Ah, oh, look at the cute dog. It's taller than the average dog and very wide, but not in an overfed way. Its hair is very long and matted, some pieces reaching the floor and jet black. Its face is huge and smiling with yellow eyes, mouth ajar. I tell her before she finishes her sentence that it's not a dog, about three times in a row. She responds with, yes, it, it, oh my god, it isn't. Before she could tell me it was a dog, it stared her right in the eye. Windows tinted nub. She feels the same chill as I did when I originally saw it. After glancing at it, I no longer looked at it directly, because I know they hear what you think. Its gait was as if a human was on all fours, extremely disproportionate and large. I've never seen fur that long on a dog. It looked as if a pelt was thrown on it and hanging loosely. We get home and my aunt says she didn't even see it, though we assumed she slowed down to look at it since my mum and aunt were very big animal lovers and affectionate. We get inside and my aunt drives home. We discuss it and she agrees that it was not a dog. I've experienced the same thing a few times before, but I believe once you know, you can always recognize them. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. These stories were brilliant, at least in my opinion, some really strong, good skinwalker stories. If you enjoyed them and liked listening to them, you can let me know down below and, you know, press the bell icon and the subscribe button for good measure because, let's face it, if you stuck around this long, you probably like what you heard. Remember, there are more stories every other day and on Saturdays, it's a huge compilation for your listening pleasure to keep you going all weekend. So yes, constant content here on Mortis Media. Who knows, I occasionally do also post shorts, <laughs> which are pretty fun too. All right then guys, I'd like to give an extra huge thank you to my members and my patrons for their dedicated support. It really means a lot. And if you'd like to help out the channel with a small monthly contribution of dinero, you can do that by clicking the link in the description to help keep things running smoothly. But for now, it's time to bid you adieu. Stay comfortable and I'll see you in the next one.